Minimize this. Yeah, that one ready to go. Okay, I think we just about here have a quorum. Mm -hmm. Let's see what else is here. Yeah, good. I haven't seen that uh, they've recommended installing 22H2 yet for Win 10. I don't know about Win 11, but uh, Win 10, they, they recommend against installing that. I've been, uh, uh, I've had uh, 10 uh, available since uh, it got released. 22H2? Absolutely. Okay, then you lucked out. I know that there are some people that have had some issues with it. Well, I, that's true yeah. every time there is any kind of an upgrade, and a lot of times with uh, monthly uh, patches. I've noticed that at least on one occasion on monthly patches where things uh, didn't work. Uh, well, particular, well, OBS Studio did not work well in conjunction with one of the patches. We reverted it, and then we were okay again. But yeah, uh, the uh, 22H210 uh, I have on upgraded at least uh, a half a dozen different uh, uh, machine configurations. And have you figured out what the difference between that and the uh, previous version was? Next to nothing. Okay. It's uh, Think of uh, uh, 22H2. There's no supposedly uh, new features. It's, uh, in a sense, like uh, uh, the old uh, uh, SR1s and uh, uh, SP1s, etc., etc., it's a, uh, a, a collection of patches. Yeah, or yeah. a cumulative update. Okay. I thought that that's what they have been releasing all along was you know, in, in incremental updates. And they rolled them together. Things didn't work so well, huh? On some machines. Well, I think uh, uh, those machines probably already had <laughs> problems to start with. In fact, I'm in Florida uh, uh, right now working on somebody's machine. Okay. And I'm still here. All right. As long as, you know, you can tread water. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, mine is uh, uh, the problem with cold. Ah, okay. Yeah, it's going to be cold here. I know. I've, <laughs> I've been outside today. Uh-huh. Mm. Well, we, well, we have clients like in Fort Myers, uh, Cape Coral down there, and man, they had like two feet of water, and uh, oh man, oh man, you know, they had, uh, oh, they got sewage, and uh, oh yeah, it's, uh, you know, uh, you hey, know. Uh, quite a mess. Oh yeah. Terry, uh, uh, hurry up and uh, uh, get over to Buffalo, New York. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, they might be moving the football game, I, I heard. Or, uh, 30 inches of snow. <laughs> they can play in 30 inches of snow. It just, it's just all a ground game then. Yeah, but uh, oh, yeah, Terry, where, where are the people going to sit? You know? <laughs> Terry can uh, uh, do his uh, civic duty and uh, uh, help uh, shovel it out. Yeah. <laughs> you know. So I've been shoveling shit for years, so no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so what we normally have here is we have open forum at the beginning of the meeting, and then <laughs> I have a small presentation today. It's not a very large thing, but it is a, a follow-on to the HDMI stuff that I had last month. <clears throat> I don't see Sanford yet. I hope uh, he got the uh, link. I did change his email as per his request. Uh, um, offhand, he was out hunting uh, uh, at least yesterday. I don't know if uh, he's back or not. Was he hunting anything specific? <laughs> uh, it's a, a deer season. I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure if, uh, yeah, it's, I thought it was also uh, goose and uh, deer and some other things. Depends on what you're hunting with, too. Yeah. I don't know if he's one that goes out there and may, tries to make it a challenge with a bow and an arrow or not. I don't know what he does offhand. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, between that and uh, mushroom hunting uh, uh, part of the year, who knows? 
Uh, I could have somebody identify some of the mushrooms in my yard. I get some really huge things that grow out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. Well, that supposedly means that you have good soil if you have mushrooms that come up in the middle of your yard, okay? Because that means you have <laughs> a, a, a viable biome in your yard. But uh, it's kind of a nuisance. These things come up with a stalk about an inch in diameter, and then they open up to a plate about this big. <laughs> Well, we get the uh, mushrooms with the mulch, you know, they love to pop up, with, uh, you know, from the Yeah, mulch. when I used to get mushroom compost, yes, and uh, earth <laughs> manure, it was, they grow in that too. This is right in the middle of the yard, though, so I don't know where this is coming from. And it's not over my septic field either, so it's not coming from that either. <clears throat> Various places in the yard. They just happen to, okay, we're going to come up here, and then... For the next several weeks, I'm digging these things out and recycling them. Uh, the animals don't eat them, so I'm, I'm assuming they're not edible. So. so who's got a question tonight? Anybody got a question? I didn't already notice, uh, I just showed you one of, uh, talked about one of my problems when I had both the Wi-Fi on and the network connected, not being one. able to access it. Anybody else got a question? I got one. Okay. So on an old X laptop hmm. how do I find and copy off all the Excel files like Excel spreadsheet files for example and they're gonna on this laptop I mean I have many different folders and subfolders and there could be Excel spreadsheets scattered all over the C drive in different places is there a way I can try to find them yeah. Just those XLS files or yeah. whatever. If you just want to know where they're at, no, I want to copy them off to a USB stick or something. Yeah, but if you just want to make sure you you got them all, because as you move them, you 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 move them instead of copying them, and then they're not there anymore until you got none left. Uh, one tool that I've used to find things is a thing called Everything.exe. That's I got I that. Okay, well, if you have everything, you can do star.xls or xlsx, and it's going to show you every Excel file, and it'll at least give you the idea how many you have. Right. And if you know which folders they're in, and you can click a sort by folder, you can you move them a folder at a time until they're gone, and then you've got everybody off. So, so I can only find them and copy them one at a time, no. There is two. There are tools that will let you find them and copy them. The question is, how do you want to copy them? Do you want to copy them to a single folder, or do you want to copy it to a similar folder and uh, a nested directory the same way and make new directory names that are the same as your hard drive? It may make a file system that's too big to put on a uh, a flash stick if it's got too many nested subdirectories. Yeah. It may no, not I work. Yeah, you know, I don't need any of the directories or subdirectories. All I need is the pure XLS files. Well, you if if you made sure that there's no re, uh, duplicate names, you could use a, an X copy command to copy them across, and it will and with a slash F, and it will find all of the XLSs and copy them to a target folder. So that would be using like that run command box. You would use a command prompt. And you would use X copy. Another option is uh, uh, bring up a uh, uh, file explorer. Well, bring up what, Kim? File explorer. Oh, file explorer, yeah. Uh, uh, go to your, uh, in the left column, uh, to your C drive and click on it once. Then in the upper uh, uh, right area is a search box. Put asterisk.xls uh, uh, there, and it'll uh, search uh, uh, the entire C drive for any such files. And then you should be able to uh, do a Control A, and then uh, uh, point to whatever media or whatever it is you're going to uh, 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 copy them to, and uh, uh, do a uh, Control V. Uh, he said he had XP, so I'm not sure if it's dependent on the indexing status of the hard drive or not. Uh, 
I don't know uh, for certain either, but uh, uh, that uh, uh, it can be checked afterwards with uh, everything if he's yeah. got it on XP. I don't mm -hmm. know if it goes that far back. It did. I used to use it back then. Oh, all right. Yep. As long as you had an NTFS file system. At one point in time, it did not like FAT file systems. I don't think uh, uh, there's a, a, a likelihood of a FAT system because uh, uh, you had to have, I think, uh, 20 or 25 gigabytes minimum. Well, I'm not sure. He said it was a laptop, so it may be a small machine, old XP laptop could yeah. possibly be there. So that's why I said, just in case, you know, it's got to be an NTFS. Odds are it was 32 yeah. gigs. It's, it's a Dell um, uh, circa 2005. Yeah, yeah that's quite close. You know, there could have been some, there were some small hard drives back then. Oh, yeah. Parallel ATA drives that uh, were only 20 gigs. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, uh, uh, in general, uh, even on those, they were usually fat 32, not uh, 16. Well, and then, but but um, everything only worked with NTFS file systems. Okay. Because okay. It, it read it by the index and not reading the bitmap and all the directories. Yeah, and, and uh, everything is on there. I've used it. Yeah, okay. Okay. Well, if it works, then you should be able to do what he described use Windows Explorer and. Um, go back to look at your drive C and then type in star.xls and then once it, it finishes searching all of the subdirectories and finds everything you want, you can do a, a control A, copy all those things and then do a paste to wherever you think you'd like to put it. Okay. But that assumes that you don't have any duplicate file. Ever, otherwise, when it, every duplicate file is going to come up, you want me to overlay it or copy it, and then it's going to rename these things as it makes copies. Yeah, there could possibly be very few, but not but hardly any. Well, okay. Usually on the duplicates, uh, uh, if you don't replace, it uh, uh, puts like a parentheses with a number in it uh, uh, for the extra copies. Okay. Mm-hmm. Trying to retire it before it retires itself? Yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> it's, um, I, I haven't turned it on for several months. And Has it been plugged in? Not not for the past couple months. Okay, if the, the longer a, a computer is not plugged in at all, is the less likelihood that it wants to power up when you power it up. Really? Okay. Well, and not only that, but uh, sometimes if uh, uh, you go too long, the uh, uh, hard drive, depending on how heavily it was used, the bearings may freeze up. Yeah, stiction. Yeah. Well, yeah, it depends on the hard drive, too. Yeah. Well, good luck if it, if it spins, then get your stuff off. <laughs> I remember taking drives out out of the uh, hard drive and then doing this thing to it to try and do a little bit of a rotation with it to get it to, to move the platters a little bit. And if it did that, then you could plug it back in again and then it might start up again. But you might only get one shot, so you don't turn it off. <laughs> yeah. Once you get it going, it's mm -hmm. all the way or forget it. Yeah. I've had... Uh, more luck with machines, even though they've been plugged in and powered down, um, just having that little quiescent current in there is just enough to keep a lot of things happy. Of course, I have other ones that you know, declare their, their uh, battery dead too, but I mean, that, that's the downside. <clears throat> if the battery is um, completely borte, pull the battery out when you try and bring it up again and run without the battery. The batteries on the old NICADs will self-discharge in about 60 days. So there will be no charge left in the battery, and if the battery charge is too excessive or it shorts the battery for some reason, the laptop will not power up. 
Yeah, there are only a small percentage of laptops that will not run without a live battery. Very small. Yeah, I've had almost every single laptop I've owned or worked on, I could pull the battery out because that was the first thing you did was pull the battery and see whether you could bring it up. And if you could bring it up, that means the battery was dead. Right. Now, if the battery is not shorted but dead, uh, it should still come up by itself. Uh, uh, it depends on whether or not the power pack is strong enough to do both or not. Sometimes on the commercial, on the uh, retail consumer laptop, the had the power pack was min uh, was minuscule, and there's not enough power to basically do a full charge on the battery and run the machine at the same time. So it act like it power failed. <clears throat> well, I've had uh, a, a number of machines where. Uh, absolutely, the battery is dead, but it's not mm -hmm. shorted, mm -hmm. and uh, I still can run the computer with the battery in it, or I can take the battery out in almost all cases and still run it right off the AC. Yeah, like this one will probably start a car if I needed to. Yeah. <laughs> Well, if it uh, if you can start up a, a, a truck that needs a jump, uh, uh, you yeah, can start probably some big money. It's probably a uh, two hundred and thirty watt power adapter. Yeah, this is uh, this is the old sc old school type of machines where they actually had more than two cores. <laughs> well, I mean, I've got a, a laptop. Uh, it's a Toshiba, uh, circa two thousand nine. And that thing, uh, uh, the power supply is uh, something just shy of five amps. Well, this one, if I plug in one of the, if I plug in a power pack less than 200 watts, it warns me. <laughs> it said, you know, that power pack you plugged in might not be adequate to run this. I've had a few, a few situations between Dell and HP where. Uh, Sometimes uh, uh, when you plug in the power supply from the opposite manufacturer, it works. And sometimes it says, uh-uh, I can't do that. Uh, so uh, I've got to uh, switch it. Most of my HPs that I have, I have enough power packs I laid into a supply because I had access to uh, some uh, refurb machines and some other machines that are being decommissioned that use the same power adapter. So I said, okay, you're coming with me. Yeah. I've done a lot of that, too. Yeah, and uh, I've even had the ones. I've had a couple of uh, power packs that have actually given up the ghost. They finally died on me. They weren't usually the HP brand. They were usually the aftermarket brand Yeah. that they used would sub. But Because um, I know HP actually had a recall of some of the power packs, uh, at least on one of the machines I had. I vaguely yeah. remember that. Yeah, um, there was a there was a problem with uh, I think it was a grounding issue or something on one of them, and it was a not it was unsafe. Don't use it. Turn it off. Unplug it. You'll we'll send you a new one. <laughs> yep. Other okay, Other questions. Everyone else brought answers. Okay, I get to quiz you then. <laughs> Anybody got their notice from Comcast that they need to upgrade their modems? Uh, I just power cycled my modem, so I don't know whether or not uh, it's any faster now. I can't really test it on this. This is all Wi-Fi, and it won't show me any speed difference here. But um, if I'm wired in, I probably would see a speed difference. They said that they increased me to 400 for free, and I don't know because when they said I was at 300, I typically would get 360. So I don't know if it's at 400 and I use one of my wired machines and test it. You know, maybe it'll test at 450. I'm not sure. Most yeah, of it's the same oh. same experience. And I've tried to get the 400, but the best I get out of it, I used to be able to get it a, a little over 300. Now, for some reason, it's only coming down at about 267, 276, something like that, most of the time. But I just uh, got you, this notice I, from Comcast that they want Doxus 3.1 by March of 23. Or they're going to cut my service. That's right. Oh, yeah. wonderful! No, but I already I, am on a Doxis 3.1, so I'm safe. But uh, yeah. when it comes to uh, 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 changing up uh, uh, the modem routers, 
I'll guarantee you right now, the only way you get it, you got to contact them and say, hey, I can't get uh, uh, beyond this point. Uh, do I need a new router, etc.? And eventually, they'll drop ship uh, uh, one to your front porch. You uh, uh, install it in place of the other one, package up the old one, and either uh, uh, ship it back or uh, uh, go to a uh, drop center and drop it in a, a, a container. Are you using a Comcast modem or your own, Harry? No, I'm using my own. I've had my own for a long time. It's a Zoom and it works really well. So I was, I've hung on to it. But yeah. they're, they're suggesting Netgear, Aris, and Motorola, and they're uh, talking about different ones that will work. Sure. Well, if if it's the Aris, and then you can get you can still get your own. It tells you right. when you get it, and you and you hook it up, then you give them a call, and they'll they'll check it and make sure everything is copacetic and and hook you up. The Without ones with problem. the Motorola label on them are actually Zoom because Zoom bought the Motorola name to use on their modem products. Mm -hmm. Aris is the original Motorola division that used to make those cable right. modems. Right. So. I, I have the Aris 8200, which is uh, like it's got a you know full gigabit if it needs to. Um, mm -hmm. It does not have any wireless adapter in it. Okay, well, they were recommending the Netgear, and I was looking. It looks like a Netgear 2100 would be about the a best option, and I think on Amazon it's about 169. Yeah, they, it's it, usually between one and 200. That's right in there for most of the modems. Yeah, so. There's no way to, that, that's mechanical function within the hardware, right? It's not something that software can upgrade. On um, no, the 3.1 is definitely beyond a software update. That required more hardware. It has to be able. I don't know why they're pushing you to go to 3.1, however. A lot of people are doing that. They pushed me to go beyond my original uh, surfboard 6120 because it was only four up and four down. And they said, oh, but you're going to keep everybody else in your neighborhood as slow speed if you don't upgrade. And then they stopped asking for a while. And then I finally got around to getting the new one. And with 3.1, it's uh, 16 up and 32 down or something like that. I mean, it's ridiculous, the number of channels yeah. it has. <laughs> yeah, but, but uh, uh, a lot of the carriers have been pushing uh, off and on uh, uh, the 3.1 if you are getting your own equipment. Uh, otherwise, they provide it uh, uh, if you're renting. Right. right. $14 a month now, I think, with Comcast if you rent it. That would wow. be a surprise. That's, that's, just, that's just for the modem. And if you want Jeez. the combined one, I think it's 21 Jeez. Rip. That's a rip. <laughs> yeah. That's, <laughs> you know, I, I thought that a long time ago. That's why I had my own. Yeah. I'm wondering when the... Uh, the actual wired ones are going to support the two and a half gigahertz uh, wired Ethernet because I'm starting to see some of the switches show up with the uh, 2.5 gig switches now. Netgear is pushing it, and I'm sure others will as well because um, then I could do more with the wired side. I think the wireless side, this pushing a gigabit, is more you know um, ridiculous because you have to use so much bandwidth to get you know to get to those speeds oh you can do two gig oh, yes you can do two gig if you're 15 feet away from your router <laughs> and you use all of the entire five gigahertz band all you use 160 megahertz of bandwidth oh you can do it that's the default they set up those things to do is 160 megahertz bandwidth <laughs> and then that wastes all of that spectrum from anybody else that's you know next door to you i don't know how close your neighbor is but i can see four neighbors from here no, I've got about 10. Cause <laughs> yeah, the closer you are, the worse it is. And yeah. forget about 2.4 gigahertz. It all has to be 5 oh. to run anything close to those speeds. Or 6 if you're on Wi-Fi 6. Yeah, I've got Wi-Fi 6, but I don't have a... Uh, for the most part, I haven't had any real problem with it. Other than well, you have Wi-Fi 6. Did you upgrade your laptop or your Wi-Fi or your wireless adapters to support 6? Um... I did the one laptop. I the iPads are running. I don't. I don't I just run. Yeah, they don't normally support Wi-Fi six out of the box because yeah. that's too new. So right. they'll only do five gigahertz Wi-Fi. They won't do the six gigahertz right. at all. Yeah, yeah. When I run speed tests on them, they're always low compared to the the other. 
computer. Yeah, you'd have to buy and uh, install uh, uh, new Wi-Fi cards. I do that quite a bit. Yeah, it's just an apple. <laughs> on an apple. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can. I've got uh, two Macs, and uh, Man, uh, they're old. Yeah, but not a, I don't think you can do it on an iPad. <laughs> iPad's a little rough. You got to open yeah, them up. That's right, <laughs> and that's a uh, you got to know what you're doing on that. Yeah. And that glue does not come off the back easy. No, it doesn't. <laughs> and you got to have a, a proper kit yep. just to put it back together again. Yep. Yep. You got to have the right nice thin tools to be able to get it apart too. Uh, go look at uh, ifixit.com. They sell the uh, tools and kits uh, uh, to uh, do those kind of things. You better be really good and a steady hand if you're going to open those things up because you can break a connector really easy when oh, you're trying yeah. to get that thing off. You can uh, uh, screw up a lot on those things that oh, you yeah. don't know what you're doing. But that's my, why my curiosity hasn't hasn't expanded that much yet. <laughs> um, that's why I prefer to have multiple um, independent Wi-Fi access points on different channels mm -hmm. if I'm going to do something because. I want the distance more than I want the speed. Uh, right now, I'm about 55 feet away from my wireless router. And if I try to run faster, I'd have to be closer to it. It means I'd have to be in a different room, and it's mm -hmm. too much aggravation. I mean, I could put a wired Ethernet between the two and then run it closer here, but I'm still going to be limited to a gigabit if I want to do that. Well, I'm I'm pretty well limited with a 1,200 square foot house anyway. So that okay, I'm sitting up in the middle of the house on the upstairs on the first floor and the basement works all right with the stuff I got. In fact, I've got I'm using the wired connections on the basement one one of them one, anyway. Yeah, one thing they don't tell you, however, okay, is oh you you're going to two and a half gig or whatever you're going to a full two gig. Well, remember Wi-Fi is a half duplex protocol. Every time it sends a packet, it's, it's waiting for the knowledge of that packet before it will free that space up. Now, I can send multiple packets without, you know, and then waiting for acknowledgments, but it's, I mean, depending on the, the protocol, but for the low level and the low level wireless, for it to talk to its access point from the machine, it's waiting for an ACK on each one of those packets coming back. So it's basically half duplex. If I'm plugged into a full duplex, uh, uh, gigabit Ethernet, it's full duplex. I can send and receive at the same time. Mm. Okay, so it's got a little bit edge in terms of the latency on the actual raw packet going back and forth before the acknowledgement comes back. Right. So, and then if there's any sort of interference on your setup, then that just adds to the aggravation because then it's retransmitting a packet that didn't make it. With wired squid technology, there is no packet collision because the switch decides that there's going to be a collision long before you even see it. It buffers yeah. your packet and then sends it as soon as the medium is free. But they don't happen to explain that on the why on the on the super fast Comcast commercial. What they should do is show it moving fast. And, and, and pausing every once in a while. <laughs> Which would look kind of strange when the guy gets into his starship and it starts. <laughs> like a dotted line, right? Yeah, like a dotted line. That's, a, that's probably a good analogy. It should be a dotted line, not a straight one. Yep. Okay. Uh, I well, mean, there's other issues that uh, I've had recently. I think Comcast had an outage not too long ago. Um, that affected the network portion, not just the physical portion. Because I had some stuff that uh, they uh, they rolled out their new website and their uh, interface, the, the the web pages did not load properly. Have you that uh, a couple well, weeks ago? Yeah, I think so. It's good, but because they oh we're we're coming out with our new you know you'll have to find a new way of doing stuff. And my wife was complaining because she couldn't find her email anymore. And they make it more difficult. You got to log into your account, and then you got to go down to a box and check email, which is harder on a phone than you might think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know the email has been really bad for the first row, at least the first couple couple weeks of November. Now this week, it seems to have cleared up, and it's it's running fairly fairly decent. 
but yeah. I was getting my normally the way things come in. It, it takes a break at night when I when I do apparently because if I get up in the morning at six, there may be one or two messages, and then when a half an hour, all of a sudden there'll be a flood of other ones come in behind them. Uh -huh. uh, but then it's it's like the nighttime. There's a gap in my email. Uh, uh -huh. Where that something isn't functioning and you don't right. see any received emails and you know emails are coming in all the time anyway. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just a third party email account which then feeds Comcast and ah, okay. I'll go back to it and look and see what time messages came in there and then look at Comcast to see what time they came in there and sometimes <laughs> there's been a two or three hour gap on some of them. Yeah, where they're not listening to their own input ports to receive email. Right. I know that on my Outlook account, um, I've been kind of surprised. I think they're trying to push push people away from the free Outlook accounts and Hotmail accounts mm. by allowing more spam to go to those now. It used to be pretty good. I hardly got any spam on my Outlook account. And now I'll have read my email, cleared all the inbox and everything else, and then by noon, I go and check, and there's 50 spam emails or junk mm -hmm. emails already, and they're like, and I gotta, I have to look in the junk emails because every once in a while, a good one gets stuffed in the spam folder, and it's not supposed to. Yeah, and there's a couple of them like that. Um, that Woody account I've got, I have a problem with that thing. Oh, he seems to want to go to the junk account no matter what I've done. I've tried to white list it and everything else, and it still happens occasionally. It doesn't happen continuously, but it will uh -huh. happen. Well, I've been fortunate. My Woody is still showing up in my Yahoo box. That uh, that one seems to make it pretty regular. Although I did see an Ask Woody free. One of the I get one from the paid, one from the free. I got two things coming in, and sometimes the paid comes into my inbox, but the the free one ends up in the spam folder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Somebody that used the magic. One, it should be. Well, if you just use the words over 18 for any reason, it <laughs> usually triggers a spam filter somewhere and immediately sends it to spam. There you go. <laughs> there was over 18 representatives for Illinois Health involved. <laughs> spam filter. <laughs> right. <laughs> over 21 is the other one that you get caught to. <sighs> but um, no, I, I, I actually have rules that I set up in my Outlook inbox, but unfortunately, if I don't have my uh, client up and running, uh, it's not processing the rules. I wish it would process them at the server end, but it's not. Hmm. It's probably because I don't have a paid uh, yeah, account. That's, that's probably why. If I had a paid account or something like that, then they might come through and say, okay, you know, we will uh, we'll let you do this, because with, with um, Commercial accounts, I used to do that all the time, and a lot of my junk would be filtered out. But I found two different kinds of, of messages that I've been filtering off. One of them was my old filter that when it came from certain locations in China sources, it would automatically delete it. The other one, uh, this new set of junk mail, appears to come from uh, compromised Azure servers or accounts on Azure servers from Microsoft, and they almost always have an email address that says office at, and then fill in a domain name that they've randomly chosen. Hmm. So I started deleting everything that comes in with office at, and made a rule for that. And between the two rules, that makes a, like about 95% of the spam messages get shoved into the deleted folder, which I immediately empty. But I've just, you know, check in to see, okay, where are these things coming from? I will occasionally uh, chase down an email, and then I will use the, uh, I will take copy the header, and then I'll use, there's a uh, email analysis header on Microsoft okay. that you can paste in the header into the top box and then analyze it, and it will take it apart for you and show you all of the individual nodes that were involved or supposedly involved with this mail message. Hmm. So in case you're ever trying to track down email, that's one of the tools that pretty easy to find. Uh, some of the other ones I used to use have disappeared off the web, um, but that one still happens to live and it's pointing me at the right servers, which are Azure servers somewhere, so I'm like, okay, uh, 
you guys should clean your own house before you start looking at mine. Okay, any other questions? All right, no questions. Well, if you want, I can go ahead and show you my presentation, and then we can uh, discuss afterward if you wish. So let me go ahead and pull it up. I can get the right share screen here. Okay. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so um, last time, uh, last month, I had uh, a primer on HPMI. Um, and I promised I was going to have some additional stuff. I still might have some more in the future, but um, this is the, uh, the second part of one of the things I wanted to present. Is this recorded? I will send a copy of it out to everybody who's on the thing as well. Oh, okay. So when I'm done, I'll send it via chat and you'll have the PDF. Okay, good. So the ins and outs of HDMI. Um, I mentioned that about HDMI being split last time, and it's not just a two-way split. You could split it 8, 16, and even do multiple splits if you wanted on splitter on top of splitter, but there's some additional delay that happens when you do some of this, and it depends on the processing power within the splitter. Um, the one caveat is when you split, the maximum resolution is whatever the lowest resolution monitor can support. So you can have higher resolution. It's just that make sure that the, 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 the monitor with the least resolution isn't one of the contenders and what you want to split to. Um, so splitting is basically downstream. Okay, so I have a source and I want to split it to multiple destinations, multiple TV monitors. That's what a splitter is used for. There's another thing called a switch. And switches are used for the input side. So if I have multiple sources that I want to select, that's what I would use an HDMI switch for. So um, you can get switches that support 1080 and 4K and, and whatever, but the higher the resolution switch, the more it's gonna cost. And why should you use a switch? Well, as I found in some articles, they warn you that the socket and plug for HDMI isn't meant to be plugged in and out probably as much as we do as USB. They're a little more fragile in some respects. So there's not an unlimited plug-unplug cycle that you can do with HDMI. So they will wear out. So one of the thoughts is having a switch that you would use to plug stuff in and out, and you can always replace the switch if it wears out and you leave it connected to your TV or whatever input source you want. Um, there are HDMI switches that support multiple inputs and outputs, but not always simultaneously, okay? Um, you can select the input to be used for one or more output ports. When they designate a switch, they'll do number X number, where the first number is the number of inputs and the second number is the number of outputs. So if you see a 1x3, that's 1 in, 3 out. If you see a 4x4, that's 4 in and 4 out. There are switches that can handle multiple inputs and outputs simultaneously, but they are specially called matrix switches. Um, uh, there's a mono price, and you, you pay appropriately for a 4x4 four four matrix switch. I mean, that particular one, I think, was like $350 versus the regular switch which is maybe $109. Hmm. Okay, let's go back here. Um, oh, and also, how far can HDMI cables be used? Um, usually, they recommend no more than 25 to 30 feet. And some people have suggested 50 feet might be the maximum. However, you're not gonna go into the store and I need a 50 foot HDMI cable. Somebody's gonna have to make this thing up special for you. You're not gonna be able to find it either online or in a store, uh, because that's really pushing it, and it may not be as reliable as you hoped, especially if you're running really high definition. If you're using 4K, you're typically down at three meters max. But what if you need to go 50 feet or more, and or you can't get a cable with the connectors on between the source and the destination? I happen to have a recent uh, issue where I had to 
try and figure out a way to put an HDMI location in an, in another office. And I had steel beams and uh, concrete uh, mortar to go through. And I only had enough room just to get the cable in, not anything with a connector. Not even an Ethernet connector could sneak through there. Hmm. So you can get balins for wired cable where they use Cat 5E or higher that can go upwards of maybe 100 meters, OK? Um, some resolutions, uh, sometimes the length is less than that. Depends on how much money you sink into the balun. Um, you can also get wireless balins as well. Um, there are ones that advertise 150 meter distance with HTTP 1.3 support that will support 4K. But they use 5 gigahertz, and they caveat it with, we'll support that distance without obstruction. That means free air, no wall. <laughs> So your mileage may vary if you're trying to use a wireless bail-in between two locations. You should test it first before you turn it loose. Um, there are 4K wireless uh, bail -ins. There's also 1080. The 1080 ones are much cheaper, you know, around 100 bucks for a pair of uh, for, uh, 1080 wireless bail -ins. The wired bail -ins are maybe $24. Um, uh, and also, they don't require a power pack on the remote end. They also buy power down the cable. And then you don't have to worry about powering just yet another wall wart to worry about. Um, the difference between wired and wireless is somewhat clear, but there's less interference possible with wired valence. Um, it's going over twisted pair. It's not going to interfere with too much as long as you keep it away from... Uh, uh, light fixtures and such, yeah, and magnetic ballast, you're probably fine. Um, there's also HDMI valence, which can use coax and 1080p resolution typically, but those were older and it's more expensive. If you happen to have coax between two locations, you can use it. There's also HDMI valence, which basically will put it it's called a Balin, but it's really a transmitter. It takes HDMI and it'll put it on a TV channel. And then you can pick it up, um, like on a TV, on another section, on another particular channel. So as long as you're not using that particular frequency on your cable, it could actually share it that way as well. So what's, the, what's most cost effective if you're going to do any of these? Hmm. Uh, if you're only doing 30 feet, well, you know, you can you pick up a $15 cable and you're, you're good to go. Uh, if you need to go more than that, well, you got to choose how much do you want to spend and how much do you want to do with wiring. If you want to do wired balins and you can run the wire yourself and then terminate them, terminating isn't that hard as long as uh, um, I don't like terminating Cat5 cable into the plugs. I find that's usually a little bit of a problem trying to get all the wires lined up before I push the squeeze and crimp it down. I found more success um, getting the um, socket end um, that I would plug and would have on a wall outlet and then pushing down the wires and it's even color coded on the back of the socket. So if you follow the same color coding on both ends, you're going to have a complete cable back and forth. And um, you, before you plug in everything and try and run HDMI down it, sometimes it's better to use a cat file, like a um, cable tester or uh, eight wire Ethernet cable that Bud basically basically checks all of the individual lines to make sure it can transmit and receive on them. I have one of these units that has a sender and a receiver, and when I turn it on, it flashes each pair in turn, each light, and it'll show me which one is terminated properly. And if it doesn't light up, then I know that wire is open. Go check the push downs a little bit more and push them down better, and then it was working fine. Then you can plug in the balins and away you go. 1080 P paid um, balins were about 25 bucks for a set on sale at Amazon. So that's basically most of what I had to talk about on uh, HDMI for the second part. So, and then I have the uh, same references. If you ever want to figure out everything there is to know about HDMI, this is the place to go. Um, the Wikipedia article, and if you want to get the actual um, specification, you can sign up for an account on HDMI.org and you can download it. I think they even have the 2.1 down there as well. 
So you can do all of those things. And what I will do is I will go ahead and send this everything you wanted to know about HDMI part two. So if you open your chat windows, you'll see I put a copy of the presentation there. Okay. All right. So that's what I found about HDMI. And that's a little bit of some of the stuff that I discovered while I was wiring stuff up. And they, as I said, um, I was terminating Cat5 cables into sockets and uh, had, uh, had a little bit of an experience there. The cable I had was stranded cable, not solid, um, but it was rather stiff. So I had to try and make sure I got all of the wires in the right spot, push them down. The socket that I bought was a uh, an outlet that I got from, uh, it was Menards of all places, along with a wall plate, and uh, even came with a push down tool. So even though I had a push down tool, I didn't have to use it. it had this little piece of plastic that did just fine job, push the wire down onto the, on the connection and let it rip. A couple of jumper cables, tied them into the HDMI valens, and all of a sudden I was transmitting the uh, information to the monitor, and it was probably about 60 feet of cable that I ended up using after I finished wiring it through the, uh, the ceiling of the uh, church. So that's uh, first-hand experience. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Has anybody else tried to do any uh, wiring of HDMI over distances? No. I know Sanford would have been the one I would have suspected would have done some of that. Because he was uh, one of the more interested in uh, HDMI. I mean, there's other things out there as well that are okay. Hopefully he can pull up a copy of the presentation as well. Mm, if nothing else, I can... Uh, uh send it to him. I've got to send the video to him anyhow. Okay. All right. So um, that was some of the st stuff that I had to uh, talk about tonight. I had, um, I also wanted to let people know that uh, I don't normally have a meeting in December because it's usually too close. The third Thursday is usually too close to uh, Christmas. It's a little over a week away. And I think one of the other groups was going to meet on that light. So I will, uh, I happily uh, vacated my night in favor of their night. So they can have it closer to Christmas if they want. <clears throat> Sid, you're too quiet. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm not feeling well. Oh, sorry to hear. I'm just, I'm just sort of sitting here watching the room spin a little. I was downtown at the Lyric, and, and and the thing about Don Carlos, it's long. Yes. Very, very long. It was close to five hours. Oh. So I. That's, um, a, that's a three intermission. <laughs> and they only do one intermission, and it's after two hours. Oh. Um, and the and the aisles are just far too narrow, and I finally gave up and left before the last act. Just, <laughs> my brain was gone by then, so I'm oh, just a bit, I'm a bit out of it. I'm here, but I'm a bit out of it. So okay, uh, I just was just curious. I'd seen you uh, on Facebook a lot of things you were doing. Like, wow, well, keeps yeah. them keeps them busy. Well, you got to keep busy. Tomorrow night I go to the Acadia Theater, Sunday down to the Goodman for Christmas Carol. Okay. And then after that, I'm going to the Oil Lamp Theater for It's a Wonderful Life. Um, Tuesday, I'm out to Elgin to do lunch at the Spartan Terrace, which is the school uh, restaurant, which does really good stuff. Hmm. And then Thanksgiving, I'm headed up northwest. Okay. So, Trying, cool. trying, trying to keep busy, but well, as, you're I, dead. as I as I said, I'm just right now kind of, and it doesn't help that my dog right now is going play with me, play with me, play with me. <laughs> she's in she's in major play with me mode. Uh huh. Now she knows you've been out too often since she what? wants her time. 
There you go. What I didn't understand looking at the picture of the new refrigerator was you had to turn the cabinet door, but it doesn't look like that door then can move now. And how do you get to that anyway? The whole side opens. The, the one side opens and then the whole side, other side opens. Of so that thing cabinet? in the middle that looks like it's a handle isn't a handle. Oh, it's a handle for the whole door. Okay. So it's a side-by-side. -side. There's only two doors on there. No, not no, I'm not talking about the refrigerator. I'm talking about the cabinet above the refrigerator. Oh, that you guy, said yeah. you had to short. I didn't shorten that. I repositioned the uh, both of the um, panels up higher on the cabinet. So it doesn't, it, basically they're not inset panels. They're overlay. So they go over the opening. And I moved them up. So you can actually see underneath, if you're on top of the refrigerator, you can actually see underneath the bottom of the door into the cabinet. But from down here where most mortals are, nobody can tell the difference. So the cabinet's still openable? Yeah, it's, it's just clearing it. Yeah, okay. clearing it. I mean, it, it, if, if it, it can, the humidity increases, it'll start to rub. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's All that right. close, yeah. Yeah, because it looked like there was a bump-up part at the front of the refrigerator, and looking at that cabinet door, it didn't look like it could get past that. When I first pushed the the refrigerator against it, it pushed against the door. So it that's that how close. Um, there's a little bit on my Facebook story. Originally, when the previous refrigerator came in, it also was too tall, but it was too tall on the back, and it wouldn't go underneath the cabinet at all. And of course, the cabinet above the refrigerator is usually relegated to spirits of all sides, of all kinds. So the booze cabinet had to come down. So I pulled it down. This is 30 years ago. I pulled it down and emptied it out first, took the uh, doors off. I needed to get free up another half inch. And I noticed that there was on the fr face frame and the sides of the cabinet, there was at least a half an inch before it hit the the bottom part of the cabinet because they designed it that way like you can put a light or something underneath some of these things so it needed to be it was 16 inches and I needed it to be 15 and a half so on the table saw I set the rip fence to 15 and a half and I ran it through four times <laughs> <laughs> took, took a half an inch off the all, all edges uh, on the bottom remounted the cabinet and pushed the refrigerator back and it was fine for the last 30 years so I look at this refrigerator. I didn't really look at the hinge. I just saw the hinge up there and said, oh, the hinge is at 70. I should be okay here. And I, we get it in, installed, pushed in, and I pushed it back, and oh, hmm, guess what? <laughs> I can't open the door. <clears throat> so then I start thinking about it. Do I want to pull it down and try and shorten it again? Or what am I going to do here? No, I need to Oh, there's room here on the door. I bet if I took this door off, I could move it just up enough. Do I have three quarters of an inch? Just barely three quarters of an inch. Uh, the one side did rub a little bit on the soffit because the soffit isn't exactly perfectly regular. Uh, the other side cleared it pretty good. But uh, it's really hard trying to screw the put the screws back to drill a hole and put the screw in because those hinges are spring loaded and they want to. <laughs> they don't want to sit flush on the surface when you're trying to drill a hole. So you got to push really hard and then try and drill one hole, run a screw in so you can hold that one flush, and now you can put the rest in. So it is functional again, and the door's open, and I can again, I didn't even have to empty this, empty it this time. But I also toyed with the idea of pulling the entire um, cabinet down and pushing it back so it's flush with the previous cabinet. And then the only way to access it is to go up there and uh, with a step ladder to put anything in and take anything out. I could do that, but that would, I still might rub into the problem because that uh, it wouldn't go in eight inches and I needed 10 inches to open the door. So it means I would still hit something when I tried to open it. I couldn't open the door all the way. So and, this worked well. <laughs> okay, and then you you posted something about artisanal ice. Well, they call it craft ice. Okay, so I I just thought I'd 
be humorous and put a bottle of glue next to it. <laughs> craft ice. Well, that's what they call it. They call it craft ice, but it's not really craft ice. It's decorative ice that comes in almost large round. I'll go get one. I'll show you. <laughs> There are two options for this. There is three and six. <laughs> the, you can see it's only rounded most of the way and then it's flat uh, on that side. If I tried it to some other way, it's not quite flat. But it, there's, a, there's two modes of operating. Um, three, which allows you to do clearer ice cubes or clearer ice cubes or six, just make me the dang ice cube. <laughs> so six is make me the dang ice cubes, although it's only made three ice cubes in the approximately 24 hours I've had it on. But I'm not sure if it takes priority to the front ice maker, which makes small cubes that you can dump into your glass easily. These are supposed to be for drinks. So because they're bigger, they don't melt as fast. And because they don't melt as fast, they don't dilute your drink. And of course, they fall into a tray in the back of the fridge, freezer, and they, they give you this little tiny rubber pad that says helps reduce the noise it makes <laughs> when it bumps down. Because I did, was hearing it make noise, but um, the nice thing about this, and unfortunately I can't show it too well on my computer because they don't have a computer version of this. They only have it running as an app on your phone, but um, they will, it will show you, no, wrong button here, that's there, useful features, energy monitoring. So it's telling me right here that so far this week, it has used 1.5 kilowatt hours and on a daily basis, if I wanted to look at the individual days, it lets me see individual times like that and how much power it's actually used. So um, it's rated at 315 watts, I think is what the entire, see it's a 27 cubic foot side by side, 315 watts. Um, typically hourly usage has been around 100 watts when it needs to. Sometimes, most of the time, it's less than that. So it seems to be a lot more efficient than my previous refrigerator did. Um, I share the same outlet with a 1400 watt microwave. And if the microwave is operated on full power and the old KitchenAid compressor kicked on, and you were doing anything more than about a minute of cooking, I'd have to go downstairs and reset the breaker <laughs> because it would pop the breaker. There was that much current drawn. I know that microwaves, as they get older, will draw more power and they'll deliver less. So they become progressively less efficient over the lifetime of the microwave. So if you take a brand new microwave and you take your standard whatever 16 ounce cup of water you're going to cook and you put it in there from two minutes and then you 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 uh <clears throat> put it yeah put it in there for two minutes and then measure uh what the temperature of the water is after two minutes that's your standard when you first got the microwave do it again five years later if you still have that same microwave and see how long it takes to get to that same temperature what I used to do in two minutes now it takes me two minutes and 22 seconds or two minutes and 30 seconds. And that's just because I've had this microwave. It's actually the second microwave I had. They're both the same model. That I was able to get the same model. It's a Panasonic inverter technology. I have one. 
yeah, I, I like that model. Uh, the first one I had, the micro within five years, the microwave um, tube itself, the magnetron, started running off frequency, and as a result, it was generating a lot of heat without delivering power to the thing you wanted to cook. So all of a sudden, you feel the back of it, and it's like you can burn your hand on the back side of the case, but it wasn't heating water. That's how you know the microwave uh, magnetron has has developed a parasitic, and it's running on the wrong frequency. A who? A parasitic. Huh? It oscillates at the wrong frequency. It's supposed to oscillate at 2450 meg megahertz or panel 10 Wi-Fi. <laughs> that is the frequency a microwave oven runs at to heat water. So there's other frequencies that will also heat water. Um, there used to be, oh, I want to say 60 years ago, there was some of the original Amanas that ran at 900 some megahertz, because that's the other frequency that water will vibrate at. But it wasn't as efficient, and then they found that 2450 works so much better, and you can, you can build magnetrons that always operate on that frequency, because it's based on the size of the magnetron cavity. But the, the, the downside of that is, if it oscillates at the wrong frequency, it can oscillate as a harmonic of the 2450 and not do what it needs to do. And that's what happened to my first microwave. <laughs> so, and at the time, um, they uh, probably still don't. They wouldn't sell you the magnetron tube, even though you could take it in, have somebody replace the magnetron under warranty, and you'd have to pay for the service to do this, which is probably equal to what the magnetron tube cost. But, I kept the other one as parts just in case I needed it. And as long as I keep it as parts in the basement, this one will never fail. <laughs> <laughs> I keep telling it, it's your brother is downstairs. He will take your spot from you. <laughs> uh -huh. That's like I keep a spare turntable still in the box in the basement. Just in case. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have over I have over a thousand albums, so I didn't want to take the risk. Little did I know that vinyl would get popular again. Oh, yeah. Yep. They're, it's coming back again. Yeah. Pe some people think they can hear the difference on it. I don't think they can. But let them believe what they want. It's yeah, those I, are the people that will pay extra for vinyl records then. One of, one of my ex-brother-in-laws is a sound engineer. He's mixed albums for people like Sheila E. And his he was... Early on, he would agree that vinyl was better, but he said it was because they had to learn how to properly mix for digital, and they were doing it poorly at first, so the vinyl sounded better. He said that's not the case anymore. Hey, Sanford. <laughs> So I, I started to say I wondered if those ice balls were meant for throwing at people, and right then my machine locked hard. <laughs> the LG heard you doing that, and it tried to compromise your machine. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> it is connected to the internet. I'm not sure what channel, what the IP address. That's one thing it doesn't show me. I I think there's the uh, something that might tell me what the. Uh, the SSI or the uh, Mac is on the thing. I have to look up on the top. There's a label on the very top of the unit which has the wiring diagram. That's probably up there. But there's one device that's connected at 2.4 gigahertz, and that's before the meeting started. I was logged on to my uh, links bit, and I was doing the network map, and there was a device I didn't recognize in the collection there that was not a wired device. It was wireless, and it was on 2.4. And I said, that must be the refrigerator on that, that IP address. So, but that was, that's like my network map didn't want to refresh or redisplay. So I made a decision 10 minutes before the meeting started to reboot my modem. <laughs> Not the best decision in my part, but I decided to do it anyway. I thought, well, maybe that's why a couple times I got um, some people complaining about broken audio or something on a Zoom connection. It says, maybe it's time to reboot. Because since I've uh, run these things on UPSs 
they don't reboot normally with a power failure. So last time I booted this thing was like four months ago. And same thing with the cable modem. Cable modem may have gone in and out or it may have rebooted itself. I didn't check. Um, but uh, that one I decided to reboot anyway at the same time. And I think both IPv6 and IPv4 came up, which is usually the problem. If it doesn't come up nicely, I only get one. Like only get the IPv4 connection and then I have no IPv6. But it seemed that both sides used to seem to come up okay, so I got lucky. You got lucky. I got a real honest to God pet question for you. Okay. That it's probably in your bailiwick. I have I bought these two based FEIT smart switches. Okay. And I want to put them in the same box next to each other. And because that's the way it is now with regular switches, one for the kitchen, one for the dining area. But it says cannot be used with non-dimmable bulbs, and the kitchen is is tubes. I replaced the fluorescent for LED tubes, but they're not dimmable tubes. Um, it, it may or may not dim, depends on how the, <clears throat> how the fixture responds to the way the dimmer would operate. You can try it. I mean, it, it, usually it's not going to, it's either, it's, it's either going to flicker, which would be objective, objectionable, or it's going to partially dim. I mean, I use dimmable bulbs and non-dimmable bulbs on dimmers, and I've done that for years, okay? And they'll dim somewhat. Usually you don't have a linear control of the dimming. It'll all do the dimming in the last eighth of a turn, okay, and that's what you're going to have to live with if you don't have buy the dimmable device. Even then, the older style dimmers, you if you want to dim the new LED dimmer bulb, you, you, you could actually replace the dimmer switch in the wall as well to make it work with LED dim because the difference in halogen dimming. Okay. Yeah, I don't want the light, the kitchen light to dim at all anyway. I just want to be able to turn it on and off. It'll work fine. You, whether you use dim or non-dim, on and off will work fine. Okay, because the package specifically says won't work with non-dimmable bulbs. And I found that, you know, that's, that's it, they don't want to take a chance of having something burn up. Because if you were to set it to half, um, there are some modes of operation where the LEDs won't function correctly at a lower line voltage and for a non-dimmable bulb and it could overheat. Right? If the switching regulator inside of the bulb doesn't run at the right frequency, you have the same problem like I had with the microwave running at the wrong frequency. Generates uh, Most of the power goes into heat. The bulb is designed to run at least 85% efficient and when it uses, when it's less efficient than 85%, you notice that the outside of the bulb gets very warm. <laughs> In fact, I've burned myself on LED bulbs before because the bottom section where the power supply is gets so dang hot. I think um, this one light fixture, like you said, you replace the tube with the LED tube. I have a, a Menards fixture I got. It's uh, 5,000 lumens that I almost used like a shop li a li light, or you're supposed to use it as a shop light, but I use it as a work light sometimes because I just need that much light to when I'm working on a wall or something like that, if I'm painting or something. And I've noticed the temperature that the outside aluminum gets to is at least 60 Celsius, which is hot. <laughs> Almost to the point where you burn yourself, or if you were to leave it on something, it could melt or crack it. So, uh -huh. they're dissipating heat. The heat's got to go somewhere. That's what's going to happen. And with, like I said, a dimmable bulb, um, <clears throat> yeah, not to be used with dimmable fixtures. Yeah, I hear that all the time. And I plug in my uh, non-dimmable switch into Christmas tree lights which are probably worse than incandescents in terms of the power factor and everything else, they work fine with them. So okay. you have, you'll probably have no problem with it. You may not be able to put them next to each other in the same outlet though, or sharing the two sides of an outlet, because 
um, they will probably desensitize the receiver of each one. What does that mean? If I put two of my Wemo switches, <coughs> there's two Wemo switches. Right. If I put them into the same outlet strip, they're too close to each other. When one transmits, the other guy's receiver gets squelched because it's too much power that the six inches away from it or whatever the distance is. Anywhere on the same outlet strip, I cannot reliably switch both of them on and off. If I put them in separate outlet strips and separate them by several feet, and even though they're connected to the same physical AC source, they work fine. But there's there's a there's always a problem whenever you have a uh, Wi-Fi devices. If you have two Wi-Fi devices, if I had two phones and I put them real close to each other and they're both trying to run Wi-Fi, one is going to affect the other. And it's like this again. It's called desensitization of the receiver. The receiver has got to be able to receive signal um, such that the signal to noise ratio is above like seventy minus seventy dBm um, in order to, for it to properly decode uh, any sort of speed at Wi-Fi level. If you're willing to go down to minus eighty four dBm, yeah, you could run uh, you know maybe six megabits on 802.11g, but, or A, but uh, if you want to run 54, you want to run 802.11n speeds, 180, you're going to have to have these things separated, and that's one thing they always, you know, they should warn everybody, you know, you can't put everybody's laptops right next to each other, it ain't going to work, unless they're wired. Wireless, they will interfere with each other. And, and because... Most yeah, go ahead. Most of these devices only run at 2.4. <clears throat> yeah, they're running on 2.4, but they're also, they may be running, they don't, they don't need much more than, uh, they could run on 802.11b if they wanted to, but I think these are 802.11g. So that means they could run 6 megabit. So the 6 megabit would give them the largest range. And because there's not a really big antenna in here, I don't even know if there is an antenna. I've seen some of the breakdowns. There may be a small, but I don't know how the antenna is oriented, if it's vertical or horizontal, depending on how you plug it into the outlet. That may change how well it can receive from your access point or your uh, router. Um, but it's when it's sitting there next to drywall behind a couch three rooms away, yeah, it can be marginal. <laughs> Sometimes to make sure I can switch the things, I will put them on a uh, on an extension cord, okay, and then it'll keep out around the bottom of the couch, and oh, it can reach it there. But I had, oh, I even had a couple that were maybe six feet away, and one would interfere with the other a little bit. Sometimes I would look at my devices and, huh, oh, how come I can't see the Christmas tree light? It doesn't show on. It doesn't show us online. Why are you offline? Well, he was offline because it was too close to the other device. So then I fired, started to separate them. It's like, ah, that's more reliable there. He can see the Wi-Fi signal. He has no problem. Fire him up. Great. So it wouldn't solve that if they were each on a different channel? Um, yeah, it would. It could. It could help. You still have some desensitization, but... Um, because they are both on the three centimeter band, um, they are you know somewhat guilty. I mean, even running a microwave can interfere with them. The microwave runs on channel ten, so if you have a thing set up to do channel eleven, channel ten is close enough; it's going to interfere. Um, I've seen desensitization across the entire band. Just having channel one and channel eleven, I've seen some desensitization depending on how close and what power you're running. It's running full power. It's running the full 50 milliwatts that it's allowed to run. That's a lot of power, and it's trying to decode microwatts coming back in. So, I mean, there's there's orders of thousands of difference between the transmit and receive signal between the two that it's trying to make up for and trying to communicate with. Um, now, if they ran on different bands, like 5 gigahertz and 2.4, no, they have no problem. Or but, you put an insulating strip between them out of metal, maybe. Oh, yeah, if you put something else, but then you may shield some of the signal between the two. 
or between it and the access point. You're going to make sure they can both see the access point. And uh, there's uh, there's the old um, interference problem of the man in the middle type of thing, where uh, <clears throat> if you have um, a signal, an interferer um, on on I can I can have the access point in the middle. I can have my two people on either end. And the one guy at the one end can interfere because he's transmitting to the access point at the same time the other guy wants to transmit. And wh whoever's got the stronger signal to the access point wins. So yeah. one guy ends up doing retransmit, retransmit, trying to get his packet in. And hopefully the automatic back off interval with Wi-Fi will handle that when it wants to retransmit the packet and it'll eventually get in. But I have, uh, I've dealt with interference limited Wi-Fi deployments. And anytime you have uh, any sort of significant retransmission going on, above 5%, you usually have a horrible Wi-Fi experience. 10%, you almost can't use it at all. But uh, 5%, you'll, you'll notice it. It'll be laggy. It, it, things aren't responding. Um, not a good experience. Best to have it, though, is that's why they try and organize on 2.4 using only like 1, 6, and 11 and, and try and organize it so I don't have, uh, try to make it so that I don't have another access point on the same frequency adjacent to any access point. Because there will be a no man's land between those two access points on the same frequency at the midpoint between them. So, I mean, they're both running the same power and they are using omnidirectional antennas. I mean, the ways around it is to use directional antennas and other things, but not too many people are into uh, beam forming on 2.4 gigahertz. <laughs> I'm sorry, did anybody not understand what beam forming is? <laughs> beam forming is a type of Wi-Fi technique that came into with 802.11 uh, E, I think, AF. Um, that um, the access point and sometimes the receivers can change their polarization of the Wi-Fi panels and the antennas. This assumes you have much more than two antennas involved as well um, and two more than two spatial streams, but you can change the polarization and you can change the direction that your transmission is actually going in. So you're actually just doing like an old, uh, like an old um, TV antenna with a rotator. You're able to spin it around and you're able to aim it at the access point and lot, and this is all done electronically. So you can send your signal toward the access point instead of sending it through the wall behind you that's not going to get to the access point. But that's what beam forming is supposed to do in theory. And um, they used it more in 5G technologies and such. So when you're a mobile device on a 5G tower, it's actually steering its signal toward you at the direction where it received it from. So that's how you're able to communicate and you're able to roam. And it keeps track of when people are moving and where to hand it over to the next person. Yeah, the uh, the original devices with beamforming tended to not work. Uh, they, there were lots of reviews of them, and they did not hand off properly. They did not lock in properly. Evidently, the newer stuff is better at it. And evidently, there's still a bit of problem with handing off. If you're moving in an office between office offices, there's still issues with the handoffs. Well, a lot of it depends on... The, uh, the 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 restriction on those is did they even set up and do a proper site map and site walk before they installed all the access points? Because a lot of places will just go ahead and yeah, put one here, put one there, put one over there, you know, and not think about where they really need to be installed, and they don't want to pay for the site survey because somebody's got to come out and and walk through the entire office. Um, and the other thing with offices is they never stay the same. They're always changing stuff. They're taking this wall down, they're putting another wall in there. Well, that inter depending on what that wall was made out of, is it made out of fabric or is it metal inside of it? Um, that metal will affect how coverage works. 
um, Wi-Fi will work, hit an edge and go around it, depending on how sharp the edge is and what the material is made of. So if you have corner beads on your drywall, Wi-Fi can go around the corner. It'll hit the corner bead and be refracted on the end of it and go around the corner. <laughs> but you have to see, um, there used to be, um, there's some patents out there that address how you can do this. And some of it is done with a lot of empirical measurements, but there are also ways you can calculate where the Wi-Fi signal would go using a thing called finite different time domain technology and actually calculating where the wave would go and how it would respond to different material. So if you were to input everything about your, your office into a, a big, um, basically a type of map. They even use the same kind of mapping software that they do for cellular mapping with facets, little triangles to map the walls and uh, other things, and uh, what the material of what the wall is made out of. And then they would run an analysis using this finite different time domain on standard materials, and then they would know how it would respond in the real world. And then they would figure out where the best places to put your access points would be. Then you go ahead and put them in and see whether or not it works <laughs> and verify it. But a lot of people do not go anywhere near that level of work to do a proper site install. They just install these things all over and then expect it to work. One of the worst places to do that with is a warehouse like Home Depot, <laughs> where you have these giant metal racks and big hunks of metal and other stuff. Yeah, and I used to do everything to work. I know, I get it. I used to do small manufacturers, and they'd power up the heavy equipment. Yeah. Yeah, and as soon as they did, things <clears> would get wonky in a hurry. How do I know that one of the access, one of the SSIDs at Home Depot is called Orange Five? <laughs> yeah, they had uh, multiple SSIDs, and they insisted on wanting to run everything at 2.4 gigahertz. The other persons that were doing a lot of 2.4 is Walmart. Your typical Walmart has 116 access points, <laughs> and it's uh, they're all laid out in a standard pattern as well. And at the same time that they're trying to do all the Wi-Fi, all of the wireless security cameras are also on 2.4 gigahertz. <laughs> so that causes additional headache. Well, they're all made in China also. Uh, the ex back then, the uh, access points weren't. Uh, access points were made in the U.S. for the longest time, and then they finally moved them to Taiwan and then to mainland China. They were designed in the U.S., however. You know, I was, thinking, I was thinking on your refrigerator thing. What we need is a refrigerator TARDIS. Well, it's bigger on the inside than on the outside. <laughs> as soon as they figure out how to do that, then they'll figure out how to pull power from that other dimension as well. <laughs> <laughs> you won't have to worry about power sources in your electric car. It'll run forever. Uh, Sanford, I'm not sure if you can see it in the chat, but I sent a copy of the presentation out. Let's see if he's responding. Uh, I haven't looked in the chat yet. Sorry. Okay, I had to, I, I ran this presentation earlier. It was short, but uh, I'm sure you'll be able to get something out of it if you take a look at it. Absolutely, I'll I'll be able to get it back um, uh, when I rewatch this video later on after I get it from Tim. Uh, okay. All right. All right. Yeah. But he won't. But he won't see it in chat if he didn't sign on before you put it in the chat. He'll oh, he won't. See chat stuff after he signed on. Oh, in that case, you write about that. And I plus, should. I'm also on a tablet, so I'll just get it from you later on. Okay, I'll email it to you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes. So that way, you'll be. Can you re can you resend it, uh, Ed, or no? Yeah, I will resend it. Yeah, because I had to bow out for a few minutes. So. All right, hold on. Let me do both here. Let's see. Where is the thing I'm looking for? 
there it's it, yeah, it's it, chat. All right, and click there, my computer. Good, and there it goes. Okay, that's being resent. What they, what they need is a way to pin something in chat. So would be nice. Come in, yeah. It would. All right. Boom. Got by, the, it. by the way, back back to those frequency things. In the in days of old, I had an old Sirius XM receiver, and if I turned on the microwave, forget about it. The signal <laughs> completely. See now, the Sirius XM though isn't anywhere on the same frequency at all as the microwave. However, microwave ovens are allowed to leak energy. <laughs> In fact, they used to have these things you could purchase that you could put around the end of your microwave oven door and see whether or not there's any significant leakage and you could measure it. I don't think they sell them anymore because I think they're afraid of what people might find out is actually coming out of there. I think if you probably had the right piece of aluminum foil bent into a U, you might actually see it start to spark on the outside of your microwave. <laughs> Um, you're allowed to leak, oh, probably at least 10 milliwatts out of a microwave oven. Now, granted, when you're running your Wi-Fi in your laptop, you're only transmitting with 50 milliwatts. So a 10 milliwatt source is definitely going, and it's not transmitting packets. It's transmitting continuous wave. So it's just a solid blanketing signal that interferes with anything you're trying to send back and forth. And when you're receiving on Wi-Fi, your receiver on 2.4 gigahertz isn't one channel. It's five channels wide. <laughs> the signal itself is five channels wide. So at one, six, and 11 are little areas of complete usage of the band. You're actually using all 11 channels, but you're using them as a third of a band, third of a band, third of a band, because that's because the channels are spaced so far apart and you're, um, you're using 20 megahertz wide signaling. So that's a problem. <laughs> um, in fact, you could use um, a different scheme if you're willing to uh, tolerate uh, some overlap and interference between access points. The other um, frequency reused is one, four, seven, and 11. You could have four channels of reuse. If you can do four channel reuse, you could basically map the world. That's idealistically what you would like. If they just opened up the band on on uh, 2.4 to use all 14 channels like they're allowed in other countries, um, we would be better off. But um, 1, 4, 7, and 11 can be used. Between any two adjacent channels, there's a 10% chance of interference. So if you can make it so, oh, this is one, this is seven, um, this is four, this is 11, and then hopefully they don't interfere with each other, then you basically can map out what you need to do. Now, if you're doing five gigahertz, this isn't a problem because five gigahertz, if you're using 20 or 40 megahertz wide spacing, you have a dozen channels to play with up there. You have the eight channels that are below uh, on the low power of the band, which only allows 40 milliwatts. And then you have the ones on the, quote, outdoor section at the top end of the band. There's another five or six up there that can be used. And, and you can run up to one watt up on the high channel, but that's supposed to be for outside use, and you're not supposed to have it near your eyeball. <laughs> so when you have an access point that's normally running on the high channel, like above 163 and such, up 159, um, they don't run one watt. They're still running the 40 milliwatt max. But if you were outside and you had type approved equipment, you could run a full watt. And uh, any of the stuff in between, there's uh, like 24 additional channels that are in between the low end of the band and the high end of the band. Um, they can be used as well, 
with the caveat. If you see radar on these things, you must leave the channel immediately. Um, the only radar that we have in the area that uses that band is a weather radar down near Worth. And I'm not sure if that's channel 110, um, but there is a, there's a channel down there. But if you have a access point that can be configured to use those channels, it knows about radar avoidance and will avoid those channels if it sees radar in it and, and, do, and broadcast a, I'm switching to this channel and then no longer use that channel again. The other thing that's bad about uh, radar avoidance on five gigahertz, it also happens to be, um, if you see radar in the channel, it might be a Patriot missile targeting battery. <laughs> which would be something else that you would not want to transmit because some of these uh, uh, anti uh, the the, uh, the anti aircraft missiles have a feature called uh, track on jam. So if they think you're jamming, they target you. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> wake up! Uh, that's one reason why five gigahertz is not allowed at all in Israel. <laughs> So, yeah, if you have five gigahertz, you're not running anywhere near uh, in, in Tel Aviv or uh, Jerusalem. Nope, definitely not. You know, Ed, Ed, you were talking earlier about Wi-Fi. I had internet blockage, and, I, and um, uh, you know, I had AT&T uh, U-verse, so I had to switch to uh, Verizon uh, because uh, to avoid that or whatever. So... Uh, you know, you were talking about you had no Wi-Fi or whatever. Uh, I, I had internet blockage, so uh, and I don't know what's your, uh, you know, your situation. Well, it's just that the, I haven't, my my uh, router hadn't been rebooted for four months. Oh, I see. So it's on a UPS, so it, uh, just like any device, there is a thing called, uh, when you when you write code, you understand there's a thing called memory leakage that can occur in any code. Where if I'm in uh, if I'm programming in C, I malloc a a buffer and I use this buffer and then when I want when I'm done with it, I, I'm supposed to free it up in using the the algorithm free. Um, however, that can also cause things called uh, memory fragmentation after you've allocated and freed up a number of random sized blocks. So most communication systems get around this by uh, only malloting and freeing fixed size blocks of when they need to use dynamic memory and either allocate it into its own fixed length buffer allocator and uh, actually not really free the buffer up but uh, allocate it with its own internal structure so that I have a hundred blocks of block size, you know, 1K and I keep them in my own pool so I don't worry about memory fragmentation which case I could run for years that way and never had a problem. But if you're using malloc and free and somebody mallocs a block, somebody mallocs a small block, and then somebody mallocs another large block, and then they free the, the small block, and then they free the large block, it may not coalesce the two pieces together to be able to get that large block again. So what happens is systems like that will either grow and use available memory until it's used up too much memory and then the system crashes, which is like a memory allocation bug. And Windows suffers from the same thing. If you have Windows running for a year or something like that, you might discover that it crashed every once in a while. And the reason it crashed is it used up all of its available memory. It's called a memory leak. And I, thought I, I thought it was a thing with my brain. But okay. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not an Alzheimer's thing either. It's 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 a real thing, and it depends on how well the code is tested and whether it was designed to handle this stuff. I mean, the way you used to get around it is not use uh, malloc and free, but use set break, long break, and uh, set break, release break. There was some internal level two routines you could use to alloc hunks of memory, uh, or you made your own buffer allocator. And in my case, I just made my own buffer allocator. And uh, everything was was fixed size for what it used dynamic memory for, and then the system just ran like a hose. I mean, I had systems that, uh, uh, 
it ran at a 286 PC with within the 640K restriction, and it would run for months without a problem. Every once in a while, they reboot it just to make sure. But um, it had fixed length buffer allocators that my design LIFO fixed length buffer, buffer allocators that would allocate a buffer in about 10 microseconds. That's the other thing. Malloc and free can, can sometimes take a lot longer if they got to go to the operating system and extend memory and grab a hunk of memory and so on. So better if you already allocate it and hang on to it and, free, and manage it yourself, but not everyone knows how to do that. So if you're writing operating systems, you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, I do have the Dragon Book, and I know what's inside of it. That's the compiler writer one. But I've also had some uh, significant amount of internal for both uh, Unix and other operating systems that I've been acquainted with over the many years I've been programming and have written my own re real-time OSs as well. But that's, that's another story. Um, so, um, yes, if you run into buffer issues, it can cause problems. Um, that's why machines do have a tendency to uh, need to be rebooted every once in a while. Any machine that you find out that you have to reboot to get the performance back usually has an issue with memory allocation, uh, buffer allocation, and there's probably an inherent flaw in that software somewhere. <clears throat> um, with devices that are like these, we, the nice thing about these things is every time there's a power failure, it reboots them. Well, just treat up the problem. You'll not see it again until it's been running for four months. But some of my devices, I like to try and preserve like the thing called the stupid channel guide for Comcast because every time they want to reboot something and I get a power glitch, all of a sudden, oh, guess what? It's all to be announced. <sighs> <laughs> And as far as I know, they still haven't come up with an algorithm to download it real time when they've had a power failure. They'd rather just sit there and decode um, the channel and automatically pull the information down rather than, hey, go download the, the real channel guide from this source right now, get it for me. Boom, done. No, doesn't do that way. Is X1 any better now? All right. As X1 any better now? When you have mode of the, uh, Xfinity X1, um, does it get channel guide back immediately after power I've, glitch? I've no. never had a problem with it. I've had X1 forever. I well, have, the, but I have a 4K X1 box. Okay. I don't know if that makes a difference. Okay. Well, maybe that's the difference that they did. They finally fixed some of that. Because there never was enough memory for it to keep or download its own separate copy, so some of the older uh, converters did not quite handle it right. I'm still using the older converters. At some point in time, I'll convert to X1, and uh, then I'll have to deal with it. They did have to run all new wire for me to work get X1 working when they first put it in. Well, I already have the setup in my house to handle that. I have the X1 amp that I picked up on uh, um, from my own store, just found it online, ordered it, picked it up, got it, and I have a second X1 amp that I have in backup in case this one stopped working. But uh, yeah, the Unity amps were needed because if you used your own amplifiers and uh, you had lofty cable, then you were broadcasting HBO to the neighborhood. <laughs> Something they did not like, even though it was on the same frequency as aircraft, aircraft band channels. Mm. My brother got into a problem when he had an amplifier, and he plugged another amplifier into that amplifier, and he really was transmitting. And when the planes would go over Roselle on the way into O'Hare, my brother Bob was interfering with their talking. So Comcast came around like a nest of bees and <laughs> landed on my brother's doorstep and said, Avast and Forsooth, discontinue your amplifiers. <clears throat> um, that's where you have to be careful of how shielded is your coax cable. Are you using triple or quad shield cable? If you're not, you probably should. But that's another issue too. 
So do you have the X1 peripheral boxes as well? No. So then you're using the um, MOCA, or the uh, Ethernet uh, over coax between the two units. So they can yeah. talk to each other. Yeah, I have the small one in the master bedroom and the, yeah. and the big box downstairs. Okay. But they changed something up. Instead of storing on the box now, they're actually storing in the cloud. Oh, that's for the uh, for the storage for your uh, yeah. for your recording. Yeah, they right. did that. But there's the storage was in the big box, but all yeah. of a sudden they decided to store the cloud instead. And so they could restrict you to 20 hours instead of the 500 they promised you. Well, it, it was actually it was nastier than that. It was with storing in the cloud. It meant that. If they were down, you couldn't watch your own recordings. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Which is stupid because the reason they were recording was so you could watch them when you wanted to. But right. You know, and for a while, you couldn't watch it even if it was stored locally because they had to authenticate for the cloud. They Every had to time verify. They wanted to play something. They recorded it encoded on your hard drive, so you couldn't pull the hard drive out and then go look at it yourself. And the reason they did that was that's why it would have to authenticate to the cloud because it needs to go and authenticate the original encoding and get the decoding key again so it can watch it. Except Which is kind of stupid. You yeah. Get that. I I would be perfectly happy if they just stored it clear on my own local device and then they'll be done with it. Yes. Yeah, but they yeah. wouldn't do that. <clears throat> I know they wouldn't because then everyone would be able to copy their stuff, and we would find it all on on the file sharing torrent. <laughs> it's there anyway, but that's beside. It is in many places. That's true. It is already there. I uh, I haven't been on uh, those in a while. I'm going to see what I've been missing to download. I'm sure there's a half dozen things that I. Should be downloading and looking at, but I haven't. Too busy. Um, probably by next week, I should have another grandchild. So, <laughs> all right. We might be busy. Thank you. Well, yeah, what number of grandchild is this? That'd be number three. Wow, very good. <laughs> Do not know what it's going to be yet, other than a grandchild. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're keeping Thanks. it a secret. Yes, yeah, it's a secret right now. Uh, if she, they won't let her get to Thanksgiving, I'm pretty sure. So her, her due date is supposed to be Tuesday. So if it's not here by Tuesday, it'll be here Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. But we'll see how that works. Uh, between my uh, significant other's kidney stone and uh, other issues replacing hip, um, it's uh, been fun trying to help watch kids. And uh, more often than not, when I go over to help her assist her in watching the kids the uh, I have a little bit more re reaction allergy wise to the dogs so um, I, something they got there animal wise I uh, react a little bit more to my uh, congestion I did find one other thing that was interesting about asthma and I'm not sure other people here on the call here that are uh, as they but partial asthmatic mine is an allergic asthma <clears throat> but one thing that I have noticed, and my allergist mentioned it to me, there are some people who can metabolize caffeine into, I think it's theophylline, um, and that acts as a natural uh, anti-asthmatic. So when I have my four cups of coffee in the morning, um, I usually uh, don't even need to think about using my inhaler at all. Uh, I will eventually get around to using it, but my flow meter would indicate that I didn't need to use that inhaler at the time because of the caffeine I had. had. So, and I guess not everyone can, can do the same thing. It can metabolize caffeine into this theophylline, I think that's what it's called. <laughs> But like that used to be one of the original um, solutions for asthma was before they had some of these in, inhaled corticosteroids, 
they had uh, basically caffeine. <laughs> and I think uh, to some extent also um, some of the capsaicin has some similar effects as well. Although I don't think you're supposed to inhale that. <laughs> Did we have uh, other questions out there? Well, you know, when you're around the grandkids, like mine are young, you know, I get a lot of Sesame Street there and all the other stuff on the TV, you know, the kids watch. My, oh, my grandson knows how to put on Netflix faster than my wife can do it. That, well, he's older, <laughs> Netflix, yeah. yeah. He's five. <laughs> really? Wow. He's five and he's, I'm, I'm he can turn on the TV. Yeah, they have a 78 inch TV and he can have that thing on and watching Netflix. And I'm pretty sure his sister can do it too in T3. Uh, whenever yeah, you're, whenever you're yeah. visiting, you, it's more wise to ask the grandchildren how to get it on than the, than the parents. Yeah, That's well, right. I mean, yeah. Mine are pretty grade school too, so uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, he uses an iPad, it's from school. And we have to restrict his time on the iPad, although he's mostly playing games. He's not doing anything like breaking into it like I might be doing. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Anybody who can access the front panel of the device can compromise it. Yeah. Uh, you just, that's, if you have access to the physical hardware, you can compromise it. It's just a matter of time. That's one thing. Yeah, I don't care if they have TPM 2.0 or not. You know, you can still compromise it. There's a way to the hardware. You can do whatever you want. Take it apart, decode it, figure it out, then then wire it back up again, and they'd never know the wiser. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Sid. I just you mentioned TVs. Uh, Walmart just released their actual Black Friday deals. Uh -oh. on, on November 21st, they're doing a 65-inch TCL, and I have a 75-inch TCL, with Roku built in for $228. Uh, what kind of LEDs is it using? Organics? I doubt, I doubt that, but, I know okay. I'm not, but I'm not sure. But for $228 for a 65-inch 4K... That's fairly impressive anyway. Yeah, it is. Very. And, and with Roku built in, you figure the price of a Roku stick had that built in. Have you looked at all with the Roku smart home at all? I, I, I have not. This set here has Roku in it, and I have a couple of Roku devices. Yeah, I mean, I have, I have several Rokus myself, uh, but they just started advertising and released the Roku equivalent of a ring camera for your doorbells. Mm -hmm. And it, it replaces the annunciator and the camera and so on. I'm just wondering, can you do a front door and a back door? <laughs> I'll get two cameras, but can they share the same annunciator and have different ringtones or how do you do that? <laughs> but it doesn't say on their website and I didn't bother to call them yet, but Devil's I've considered always, it. Devil's always in the details. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I think Ring can, I don't know if Ring can support it either. I knew you can have multiple cameras. Uh, it's just that the question is whether or not if somebody comes up to the back door or the front door, you want it to send the alert out that says, I saw motion there. Mm -hmm. And whether or not it's going to detect it when my, 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 uh, one of the black squirrels comes up to the back yet and, and ask for a handout or not. I mean, it might be sensitive to the fact that the squirrel is standing on his hind legs and, and thumping on the window. <laughs> Don't the blink uh, doorbells work as just like your cameras do, where if you put two on, they would recognize each one separately? Yeah, but it, the, the blink cameras aren't hooked up to a doorbell where you push the button and you expect something to ring inside. That's why I wasn't sure how they handled the enunciator portion of it. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it works. With, I don't think it works with your existing enunciator. I think you got to switch something out. And whether or not the enunciator has a provision for more than one door so that whatever door is pushed, it can do the appropriate chime. You know, or do you end up with three or four enunciators on the side of the wall there? Hmm. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. By by the way, on that regard, Walmart's doing the Roku premiere for nineteen dollars. <laughs> I, I do like the, the premiere. It's finally got enough horsepower in it that I don't have to periodically check to reboot it and such. Other than the fact that the pow the remotes have a tendency to go through batteries faster with the newer devices, I don't know why. It seemed I used to never have to change the batteries in the remote, and now I seem to be doing a lot more than that. And not all apps on Roku are well-behaved. There are some apps that make it very difficult to try and get out of the app and get into the main menu again, unless I use the rip them up by the roots and said, home. Oh. <laughs> I'm tired of trying to find the exit neck click. Or do you really want to exit Peacock? <laughs> you have to back, 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 and wait for it to respond to the back. Back, do you want to exit Peacock? Yes. <laughs> I want to exit Peacock. I'm done with it. Because <laughs> I always think that pressing the home button might be one of those conditions that you don't recover all of the memory that you allocated. <laughs> That's usually another place where operating systems have issues is when you decide to terminate forcibly a misbehaving app and you don't wait for the app to release all of its memory night back to the pool from whence it was granted. Hmm. So, uh, other good stuff. So, Walmart, yes, go ahead, Dennis. Um, I've got three items. I think they're quick items. One, you were talking about the HDMI switcher. So, I brought up um, tomsguide.com, and they, you know, he's listing a bunch of HDMI switchers. One thing between all of them, and I, I don't understand it, they talk about, you know, there's two and one, three and one, four and one, you know, up to seven and one. But yeah. they talk about whether they have automatic switching, yes or no. And what is automatic switching? Well, automatic switching could be as something as simple as when I power on a device, it automatically switches to that device to select it for input. Oh, okay. I mean, it, that, that typically is what it's used for. So when I press a Roku button, okay, um, my TV will automatically switch if it's plugged into the right port. Okay. So it's on, it's on the, uh, it's, it's looking at the cable box, and I press the Roku button, and all of a sudden it switches to uh, HDMI 3, which happens to be a game port or something, which usually has a... Uh, when the automatic switching terminal enabled. So what if two devices were turned on? Whichever one turns on last takes over? Last or? one wins. Okay. <laughs> or if you have a device that's on and it's sending in it, it could, you know, confuse the switch. Um, so normally you power off the other devices if they're not being used or you're switching between them. I mean, the, the cable box continues to play, but it will not switch back to the cable box because it's not set to automatic. Okay, it's not coming in on HDMI, so I don't have the automatic switch capability to it. I mean, it continues to send video in, but it doesn't know to switch back to it unless I manually switch the TV. But if I click on the Roku or do anything on the Roku, it'll switch to the Roku. Okay. Now, if I manually switch the TV away from Roku and it was in the middle of something, Roku can see that I switched away from it, okay, and sometimes pause the thing that I was watching okay. or discontinue it. Well, yeah, it, it even says some of these come with the remote and some don't. You know. Well, the remote might be helpful if you want to manually switch it. Otherwise, you're going to be getting up out of your easy chair and going up and pushing a button on a front panel. Okay. Uh, number <laughs> two, um, I'm not on the XP. I'm on the uh, 8.1. But I did try this thing that Tim suggested, File Explorer, C Drive. I didn't know you could do the search with the asterisk in it. With oh, yeah. Paper, and it worked fine. I mean, it gave me a whole list. So I like that. That's a great idea. Well, with, with 8.1, it automatically indexed 
the entire hard drive for you. You yeah, didn't have a choice. It yeah. took a while, but that really worked well. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. And uh, number three, I think I think it was Stanford who mentioned at a previous meeting about turning an older um, router modem into an access point. So, yes. so I got this uh, a few months back. I got this new Aris modem router from Wow, which is now it's down. <clears throat> so I have this old one. And if I wanted to try to investigate how to turn it into an access point to reach further ends of my house, right? Does it? How can I say this? The thing that made it. Because it's old, the things that were at a security. Yeah, you what you would do. What you would do if you did that, you would use an older technology, which your laptop still remembers how to connect to. Okay, it hasn't turned off any of the older technology. You still have some of the older technology to communicate on the older system. It may warn you that it's less secure, but it will still connect to a WPA2 connection. Just the way it would connect to a WPA3 connect. So not it shouldn't be an issue. So um, access however, point, there's some caveats. It's the same security as the original. I, I would not set it up to be identical unless I could use the same protection. So if I have WPA2 in one place, I have to have WPA2 in the other place. And it's got to have the same password in both. Okay, because if it's got the same SSID, but on a different channel, in a different location of the house, I'm going to have the same credential. If I chose, I could put it on a different name and a different password, okay, and then I would have to add that as one of the uh, networks I can connect to. So it would no longer be seamless between the two of them. I think I just got some more of the big ice cubes this one, this spell. I heard a thud. <laughs> um, so the, uh, the thing you would do if you want to do this, okay, um, is this a, just a router or is this a router cable modem? Um, it was my own router. It is a router, okay. Wow well, used to give you a box, and then you put your own router into that. Okay, it is. It doesn't have a coax on it. It only has ether. It only has the Ethernet connection and wireless. Right, right. Okay, the way you hook up a router as an access point is is a little tricky. Okay, but if you want to be able to make it work well, what you end up doing is going into the old router and changing some settings. Number one, turn off DHCP. So if you find something that says this device will assign DHCP addresses, say no. You're going to let your main router assign DHCP addresses so you don't take the chance of two devices having the same address at the same time on the same network. Two, you're not going to be using any of the routing functions anymore. So what you're going to end up doing is when you bring your, your Ethernet cable from your, your main router into this, this older one, you don't plug it into the input side. You're plugging it into one of the four output sides. Oh. Okay. And then you can set up um, and make sure that the, the new router or the oldest router um, is got a different control address so that it's no longer 192.168.1.1, but it's 192.168.1.250 or something like that. And it's in an area where the first router is not going to use it at all. then that router can be used on a different channel and can broadcast the same SSID, same password, same security, and be useful as a fill-in access point. And it can be dual-band if you want. 
So if you have 2.4 and 5 gig, you could set up channels so that they don't overlap at all. I mean, I have um, two separate, I have two different devices. I have uh, the one I'm on right now is probably a 802.11n capable access point. But I also have another access point that only does 802.11a and 802.11g. And I have that broadcasting um, the same SSIDs and the same password, um, but in a different location of the house. And 802.11a is just fine for Roku devices that are in a different section of the house. <laughs> so I can I can put them on their own channel, have them operate, and it works just fine. The only difference between the two is when I'm connected and I do it a uh, a, a, a speed test. I, if I am only doing 50 megabits per second, I know I'm on the old access point. If I'm doing uh, 110 or something like that, and then I'm on the new access point. <laughs> because they're both going to come up with the same name. They're going to have the same SSID. So how do you know the difference of which one you're on? Well, you really don't unless you check to see what channel I'm on. And that's not easily findable on your current machine unless you look at some in, uh, uh, internal statistics. Yeah, I don't even think they show you a lot of the stuff on, uh, yeah, I think they hide a lot of the things. Oh, they, they do show, okay. <clears throat> Yeah, so that one is, the, the one I'm connected to right now happens to be the actual slow one. <laughs> so I'm only doing uh, 36 megabits per second. <clears throat> but it's adequate for what I need to do. There is a way to see it on Win 10. If you go into, you do the, the access point, and then you go ahead and say, okay, um, do the properties on it. And then when you do properties and you slide down and then you can see on the detailed properties, you can see the uh, IPv6 addresses and what channel it's on. This one's on channel 48, five gigahertz. Oh, now I'm at 48 megabits per second. So it's using eight or 11 a speed, which is more than enough for what I need to do. Could be the fact that I put this big hunk of metal called a refrigerator that's uh, sort of in the way between me and the uh, other access point. But if I were to move this like about three feet to the east, all of a sudden that'd be line the side of the other access point and it would probably switch to that one because there'd be a stronger signal. So um, remember, turn off DHCP, put a different address for the router, set it up to have the right SSID and password. It can be the same or it can be different. If it's different, that means when your signal gets too low on the one, your access, your um, your laptop is going to hunt for a newer one. Just make sure it's up near the top of the list so it can find it before it tries to go to your neighbor's Xfinity, which you probably don't want it to do. And remember to plug the uh, the Ethernet cable into the back of the other router into one of the four ports. So the way it works is anything that plugs into the downstream port on a on a wireless router, in order for it to connect to um, any of the wireless devices, it has to let any packets that come in on those four ports on the downstream of the router have to be broadcast to everybody who's on the wireless side and also to the other ports on the thing. So it does exactly what you want it to do. It acts like a wireless switch. And you don't want him assigning DHCP addresses because your main router is the one that probably should be handling out the DHCP address. And there's more than one place that probably tells you the same thing I just told you on the internet. You could look that up as well. It might even show you step by step how to do it. But I know that that way works. So I've tried, tried that before and works like a champ. Used an old 
Comp USA router <laughs> to fill in coverage. And I lent it to a friend and he used it for a long period of time before he didn't need it anymore as well. Because he had a section of his uh, house that was a add-on family room that wasn't anywhere near the second floor where his router was. And we connected it and it worked like a champ. Okay, any other questions? Good. No other questions? Good meeting. I had you did a good a great job as always. Okay, cool. Well, I might you'll see my next meeting announcement will be in January. Um December, well, yep, December they'll have a good time. Uh, I think, like I said, Southside or somebody else wanted to use my date, so I said it was fine. So hopefully um, you, I'll send out, I'll have another presentation ready, and we'll figure out something else. If anybody has an idea of what they would like me to try and present, send me an email. Have a good holiday and enjoy the new grandchild. <laughs> Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. Somebody else still has sleepless nights. So. <laughs> and I remember. That grandkids oh, yeah. are there. I'm yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay, thank you very much.